I'm just curious, were there ever any models that you worked on that you either ran out of time or just when it was done you felt like you could have done better or should have done more to it? Well, it's always the done, could have done better kind of a thing. But uh, model, the model makers were, um, you know, we absolutely loved what we were doing. So it didn't, since we were all in our 20s or now then in our 30s, no matter how many hours you spent doing something, it, you know, it didn't matter uh, if you stayed there for one or two to, to do things. And it, um, it frequently, a number of times it happened that way, you know, that you just you stay until something was done. But we also knew that there was this thing that, that you know, you have time, uh, money, and quality, and you're trying to balance those three out. And we always knew that with George Lucas, quality always trumped all the other stuff. You know, so it was our, our safety net in the background to know that uh, if we ever delivered something that wasn't super quality and super neat, um, we wouldn't get the brownie points. So uh, there was a lot of pressure to uh, you know get that final one that really, really worked. Because and just like the, or the story I said about the Death Star, you know, uh, 50000 uh, $50, $60,000 was just speck in the bucket for him, but not for the people who pay attention to money, but for him, you know, $60,000, oh my God, let's go for it now. And uh, so the quality always won out. I'll go the other thing. Good shirt. Go, right? Yeah. yeah. So what project surprised you the most as being the most difficult to complete? The most difficult? Yeah. <clears throat> what projects were the most difficult? Uh, in some ways, uh, a, a, a late project, Mustafar, was very, very difficult because we had to get a crew of people first to figure out what kind of lava we were going to do. Because there have been other movies that all had lava that was uh, good to middling to not so good. You know? And I'm not saying we did the best final lava in the whole world, but we did a lot of research and materials and tilting the, the planes and the lights underneath. It was, it was really huge, and I was the head sculptor on, on doing uh, Mr. Bar. But it, uh, all the elements had to come together, you know. Uh, the, pla the plexiglass, the lights are underneath, is three quarters of an inch, and then somebody would say, you know, if the lights are on too long, even three quarters of an inch plastic are gonna melt. If it melts, you know, that's screwed. If, uh, you know, when the log comes down, if it's on the wrong, the, the, the whole set tilted, tons of uh, changes. And uh, so it was, it was a pretty complicated thing that had a giant crew of people. There were some people in charge of just the pumps. You know, one foot diameter tubes with giant industrial pumps to pump the, to pump the lava. So it took a whole crew of uh, uh, you know, organizing and uh, coordinating to get that whole thing done. But it was used in about, uh, they shot it for about 400 shots. I don't know how many they used. It was very, very complex. Though. But, you know, you have a crew of people that you've depended on for years and years, and you, you just, you have a feeling that it's going to succeed in you know, what, what we do. All right, we're going to do three more questions, and we're going to call it Lord. Oh, Ken, Forger. Yeah, we got it. Is there any movies that you watch that you're like, man, they should have used me or someone else to make better models or special effects? that you wish you would have worked on the project make it better. Well, you know, I was really lucky that I was kind of working on flagship pictures in the first place. Uh, was there a film out there that I wish I would have worked on? I don't, I don't think so, because I was, I, I was really busy. You, know, you, had to, you had to fight to take your vacation. And, uh, you know, they would build up, they would tell you, you know, you got a month and a half, when are you going to use it? Say, well, I don't know, you know, when can we... But uh, I did, I did, on the airplane, I saw the interesting film. So the, uh, it was the two movies, the second one. And uh, it had really good effects. Yeah, you talk about Flycander. Yeah, the big cloud there, yeah. Yeah, I think it was good. It doesn't matter about the effects more, let's be honest. But, you know, the effects were really good. And it was photographed very well and all that stuff. And I never saw it originally. But on an airplane, I was like, whoa. They, they, it was a good combination of model and CG. And, uh, but I, you know, I, right at first when I retired, they used to call me to consult and where's this and all that stuff. And I kind of fell.
well, you know, I feel good about it. And then that falls by the wayside, and, and then I was like, eh, you know? <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I, I didn't want to die in the saddle. Not that I'm anywhere close to that, but, you know, the, you know being that person like this, like, Ugh! All right, two more questions. Uh, one right there. Uh, I make stuff for a hobby to relax me, and you make stuff for a living. What do you do for hobbies? Uh, well, what I did was I, I originally thought I was going to be an architect when I graduated from high school, and I'd taken classes and everything. Uh, but it, it went by the wayside eventually. I, I first made my money out of uh, college by carving McDonald's land, you know, big hamburgers and everything, and then working in industrial design. But um, when I retired, I embarked upon remodeling the kitchen just exactly the way I wanted it. I remodeled the bathroom just exactly the way I wanted it, first one and then the other, and then the dining room. And uh, so I'm finished with those projects. I'd love to be able to add another room, but that's out of question for the money center, really. And, um, but also I, I think, you know, my father had a really hard time retiring, and I, I was determined that it was, nothing like that was gonna happen to me. Uh, he, he just really had a hard time for the first three, four, five years. And I, I quite frankly, I think I, you need to take pleasure in watering the plants, or, uh, you know, uh, painting the wall where the too much sun comes in, or you know, hiring somebody to help you, or uh, planting new plants in the backyard. Or, I, I believe you also read a lot, too. You read I, I read a lot, yeah. I like uh, history a lot. I don't read, I read uh, fiction, but I, I read non-fiction a lot. He, he would be really good on Jeopardy. Really good on Jeopardy. Uh, last question. Who has the last question? You already got one. You got the last one. You're in the model shop. You're all working, trying to meet your deadline. Sure. Wait, check out your shirt. Oh my god. This guy has a Star Wars Marine unit. Uh, there we go. Is that a remake? The Darth and yes. the Hutt Prince. That's an original. Wow. Well, it's, it's pretty special. Sorry. <laughs> trying to find an original shirt. It's uh, Darth and Darth and Excuse me, the sir. Uh, there, 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 there well, is. Well, you have to stand up a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, so we're in the model shop. You guys are all working away, trying to meet your deadlines. What kind of music are you listening to? Oh, and, yeah. and while you guys are working, do you sing? Yeah, the question is we're working late. Uh, what kind of music do we listen to? Yeah, and uh, it's time for music. So it's, it's really interesting. On the first Star Wars, the, the big music at the time was Rihanna by Fleetwood Mac in that album. Oh, is that it? And we had a in the model shop went out and bought the biggest Yamaha speakers that you could buy at the time. And I, I mean, the woofers were more than a foot across. The woofers were more than a foot across. So we had them in the model shop, and then at that time you had a turntable and a amplifier. But uh, we played uh, the Fleetwood Mac uh, record a lot. We played the, uh, the Songs in the Key of Life a lot by uh, Steve Wonder. And uh, a lot of super friends. He had been married to the woman who was the manager for Supertramp, and they, they kept their piano uh, in our shop when they were in L.A. And they just, their piano was there. And, uh, that's awesome. That's cool. That's and, uh, awesome. Grant, <laughs> practice. But as time went on, um, we eventually got a, a CD player, you know, with a five disc and all that kind of stuff, and I set up a rack so we had a lot of CDs, and then when you use them, you would set up the covers so you knew what it was, one, two, three, four, five, So the music became really, really varied at the time. Yeah. And then uh, for a guy named Giovanni, at his request, I, I said, well, how about only classical until 10, and then branch out from there. Yeah. So it was everything from world music to uh, uh, psychedelic furs from England to, uh, yeah. you know, Peter Gabriel, world music, a lot of reggae, a lot of reggae. And then, and then, quite frankly, uh, I'd say the last five years of, uh, of working there uh, in the uh, 2008 or something like that, some of the
the music got pretty harsh. And, uh, I remember uh, one of the couple of the women used to chant, "No hate music, no hate music, no hate music," because some of the guys really liked it. Uh,